Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, an October uh, high rounds, October 20th, to be specific. My parents are visiting and they, my mom suggested we rename this High Times. So I don't know if she totally gets it, but um, anyway, it is with great pleasure that I get to introduce Dr. Kathy Promer to everyone um, who I think last presented a couple of years ago. So it'll be nice to um, have her presenting again. What is missing to me is her bio. So I'm gonna wing it a little bit. Um, Dr. Promer did her um, residency here at UCSD and then stayed on to do her infectious diseases fellowship. Um, and she's uh, now an associate physician here and works at the Owen Clinic um, as well as um, San Isidro Health. And what she's taken on is a lot of work in the aging population, is conducting a lot of our Medicare um, well, uh, annual wellness exams. Um, and has really moved into a space of, um, of working with and, and uh, studying people who are um, aging as they live with HIV. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Promer. Sorry for the lumpy intro. <laughs> um, and I'll keep an eye on the chat for you, Kathy. Uh, thank you, Jill. And my apologies for not sending a bio. That's my fault. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, yeah, thank you for the great introduction. I'll, I'll just, uh, be broadly talking about frailty and people aging with HIV. Ooh. I'll just figure out, there we go. Um, so I'll just start by, uh, defining frailty, uh, talking about the different ways to screen for and measure frailty and ways that we can prevent and intervene upon frailty. Um, and then my only disclosure is I recently got an honorarium through a educational grant from Vive. Okay, so uh, to start um, defining frailty, um, this is a quote that I like, that it's a state of vulnerability to poor resolution of homeostasis after a stressor event and is a consequence of cumulative decline in many physiologic systems during a lifetime. And I highlighted the word vulnerability um, to uh, touch upon that it's um, it, it's a potential to lead to uh, adverse events and that it's not just a static state, that um, it can uh, change over time. Uh, and so some examples of adverse outcomes of frailty are hospitalization, falls, disability, and uh, increased healthcare utilization. And so to really focus on one of those uh, adverse outcomes, um, falls is obviously a big issue in adults um, 65 years and older, regardless of HIV zero status. Um, and some quotes from the CDC in 2020, 27.6% um, of older adults reported falling during the previous year, um, a little bit higher in women than men. And then in 2021, uh, 78 per 100,000 um, had a, uh, an unintentional fall that led to uh, death. Um, and it was, it was reversed as far as the gender um, uh, breakdown, uh, more common in men than in women. And um, it, it's still being characterized why, that, um, why they have this gender difference, but maybe it's attitudes toward fall prevention and um, circumstances leading to fall that maybe men will be more likely to be the ones to volunteer to intervene upon, you know, something going on outside where there's ice or snow, um, climbing up a ladder when maybe they shouldn't. Um, and that's all from the CDC, not for myself. <laughs> um, and uh, or, and um, some studies have shown that there's an earlier onset of frailty, specifically in people uh, living with HIV, um, and depicted by the odds risk uh, odds ratio of uh, frailty based on duration of HIV. The longer that one has HIV, um, the higher odds they have of having frailty. And uh, um, one study showing that frailty prevalence in men living with HIV um, uh, aged 55 years was comparable to seronegative men um, age 65 or older. So kind of simplifying that to say that um, frailty starts uh, 10 years er uh, earlier in the setting of HIV. 
Um, and here's another study where they measured frailty differently. So you may see, notice that the numbers don't quite match up, um, but um, a bar graph where the darkest color is um, frailty and then middle color is pre-frail, non-frail. Um, and that, so at each age point, you see that frailty is more prevalent um, in those living with HIV. Um, and um, generally um, it gets more prevalent with increasing age. And so here's a, a biopsychosocial frailty model um, prepared by uh, Dr. our very own Dr. Young Karras. And um, all the references are in the QR code if you're so interested. Um, but it shows that um, frailty is quite complicated. Um, there's, um, you can think of it as having multiple aspects, uh, not only a physical frailty, which is how we traditionally think of frailty, but also social frailty and psychosocial frailty. Um, and I think we can all think of examples of why um, it's helpful to particularly think of this in our patients living with HIV. Um, and it has many contributions inflammation from HIV infection, um, a historical toxic antiretroviral therapy, comorbidities, depression, anxiety, trauma, stigma, poverty, um, cognition. And then um, it can manifest and also contribute to isolation, apathy, and low uh, physical sarcopenia that call, uh, all kind of feed into each other and contribute to frailty. Um, and so then just focus on one of um, one aspect of that graph, the loneliness and isolation. Um, this was again from uh, Dr. Young Karras that uh, focuses on loneliness and isolation patients aging with HIV. Um, and it, loneliness is a discrepancy between actual and preferred social relationships where social isolation is a lack of contact with society. Um, and it affects um, an estimated of 39 to 58% of older patients living with HIV. Um, and uh, it's associated with a higher rate of substance use, depression, and low quality of life, and can be explained by um, uh, uh, excess inflammation and immunosuppression. Um, and it, it's very important, but it's a, also very complicated to think of um, uh, the solutions for this, uh, building a community and um, building up support and um, to make uh, to promote um, uh, resilience with aging. Um, and here's a review paper um, on uh, risk factors associated with frailty um, or protected uh, frail uh, frailty in um, patients aging with HIV. As you would think, you know, older age contributes to frailty, um, overall low satisfaction with aging, um, we're feeling older, um, uh, tobacco use, but then in our patients living with HIV, um, uh, how long they've been on treatment for HIV, um, what their nadir was, um, and specifically exposure to DDC and how long they've been diagnosed with HIV are all things to consider. And so there, um, Measuring frailty is quite complicated in that there's so many different measures of frailty that all have different utilities and different feasibilities in the clinical and research settings. Um, most are the most probably the most common one to hear about, um, especially in research, is the freed the freed frailty phenotype, um, which is a five point measure um, that I'll go into in a little bit more detail. But it requires some equipment and um, uh, staff time using. Uh, a denominator and a, a stopwatch. Um, there's frailty indexes that are more of a continuous scale. Think about a lot of comorbidities and health outcomes um, and other various uh, frailty sc uh, scales. So here I'll talk about a little bit more about the fra frailty phenotype. Um, it has five criteria on unintentional weight loss, exhaustion, low physical activity, weakness and slow gait. And so the second two are um, the measures that require specific equipment and um, uh, staff expertise in order to measure it accurately. Um, and um, you can be um, classified as robust or not frail if you don't have any of the criteria, um, pre-feral or frail. 
and uh, uh, some and here's some of the uh, data showing the validity of the freed frailty phenotype. Um, it, you know, if they were classified as you know not frail, um, free frail or frail, um, you see a stepwise uh, association with um, adverse outcomes such as death, first hospitalization, first fall, uh, worsening disability. Um, as far as ADLs and mobility. Um, but with that, there comes some uh, specific logistical limitations, um, uh, measurement of hand grip strength um, uh, requires the dynamometer, which I, I think I'm saying that wrong, but um, <laughs> it, you have to do two trials lasting three seconds each um, and adjust for uh, gender and BMI. And then the walking speed test, you again have to do two trials. Um, you check their vitals, let them accelerate, you know, speed up for a little bit over two meters, measure them actually for four meters, and then the deceleration zone. Um, and you either take the average of those two trials or the faster, depending on um, how you decide to measure it. It's um, measured differently on different studies. Um, but uh, it obviously requires a long hallway where you're not obstructed with, you know, running into staff or equipment and, um, you know, marking it out. And overall, you know, these two, even if, even if a nurse is well-versed at performing these two measures, it would probably eat up like 10 minutes, which is a little hard with the staffing shortage. Um, and so because of this, there's been some modifications to the freed phenotype asking, do we really need this, you know, these special hand grip test or um, speed test, you know, um, is a modified version better than nothing if we don't have the resources to implement that um, right now. And so one of these modifications is aptly called the modified free phenotype, where it uh, replaces um, gait speed and grip strength with um, just a subjective question of core mobility. Um, and it has the same, you know, uh, lower cutoffs for free frail and frail. And so, um, and so I'll just be presenting some data that's uh, based on um, a study using Scenix. So I just wanted to back, I think a lot of us here at UCSD know about Scenix and probably outside of UCSD too, but um, it's a, um, a multi-state repository of point of care um, uh, data collection collected by surveys here at the Owen Clinic. We, um, we distribute like an iPad to um, patients while they're waiting for their provider. Um, and so um, with this scenic survey, um, there was uh, it includes uh, the, this modified freed frailty phenotype that I talked about in the previous slide. I see some chat, so just interrupt me if necessary. It's um, okay. It, you're just your slides are wanted, and we can talk about that later. You're doing great, Kathy. Oh, my slides are what? Oh, wanted, desired. It's fine. Oh, oh, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, and so, um, and so, you know, some of these questions may seem simple, but having it in a quantifiable um way that's you know, um easy to compare between responses. Um, some, some, some specific questions of the survey are um, have the wording like, I've, I've had uh, fatigue and it bothers me, it bothers me a lot. I've had weight loss and it bothers me a little or a lot. Um, um, saying that you don't engage in any strenuous physical uh, exercise or less than peers of comparable age and gender. And then, um, and uh, the, and then they took this uh, poor mobility from a European questionnaire, which is interesting. I have some problems walking about, or I'm not able to walk, which I think is a little bit more European in the wording. And so um, he, uh, there was a recently published study on the validity of specifically using this modified freed frailty phenotype um, in comparison to the freed frailty phenotype. So the same subjects, um, underwent the tra traditional freed frailty type phenotype classification in comparison to the responses they had in Scenics. And uh, they found that um, 
it, it had good, or their assessment was that it had good enough uh, sensitivity and specificity that it should be, you know, considered if you don't have the resources to perform um, the full free uh, frailty phenotype. Okay. And so um, here I'll just talk about a, uh, the Tilburg frailty indicator. Um, it wasn't on the, the list that I uh, mentioned earlier of um, frailty measures in patients living with HIV because it, it hasn't been used a lot in patients living with HIV, but I'll talk more about that later. Uh, it's a self-report questionnaire developed among a Dutch, Dutch community dwellers aged 75 and older to reflect a multidimensional approach to frailty. Uh, it had it's quite extensive. Part A includes many demographics, gender, age, mar marital status, uh, birth country, education, income, life events, lifestyle, living environment, and then uh, Part B, um, which is more often used to um, actually measure or quantify frailty, um, includes uh, sections on physical, psychological, and social frailty. So really mirroring that um, model that I presented by Dr. Young Harris. And so it looks quite extensive, but um, it's nice in that it, you know, it just has, you know, helpful responses of yes, sometimes and no. Um, and it can be, you know, it can be uh, the provider can administer it, a nurse, or um, it could just be presented in a, like a iPad type format where someone fills it out. Um, and it breaks it down into the physical, psychological, and social components that I talked about. And then you add up all the abnormal responses. And if it's um, five or more, then they're considered um, frail. So it's just robust or frail, nothing in the middle. Uh, <clears throat> and so um, we there is some uh, good data about um, the validity of this indicator in the general population. Um, that it's a good measure of, or it's a good predictor of disability, healthcare utilization with uh, visiting the general practitioner or other healthcare practitioners being hospitalized or utilizing healthcare with um, personal care, nursing, or um, outcomes such as falls. And um, specifically, the cutoff of five seems to be appropriate as far as um, uh, uh, measure or balancing sensitivity and specificity. And so, um, as I said, um, the this TFI um, hasn't been extensively studied in patients living with HIV yet. Um, although, you know, conceptually we can think of its um, benefits in that, you know, capturing more of the psychosocial aspects of frailty in our patients living with HIV. Um, there was a cross-sectional study um, uh, in patients aged uh, 50 years or older in China, um, showed that frailty could contribute to depression. And then um, in Hispanic uh, patients living with HIV 50 years or older, um, they showed that a higher score was associated with higher depressive symptoms and higher comorbidities. Um, so I think still, uh, you know, um, so I think it would be helpful to, you know, study more of these uh, uh, multidimensional measures of frailty in patients living with HIV. Um, and then one point I meant to touch upon, but I forgot to, um, one nice thing about this frailty indicator is there's a lot of questions that if it's abnormal, you know, you can um, specifically uh, do a targeted intervention. Um, you know, difficulty walking, maintaining balance, maybe referring them for physical or occupational therapy, referring them for a hearing test, vision test, uh, or optometry, um, uh, talking about, you know, treating you know, their um, psychosocial or their psychiatric comorbidities um, and maybe how they can build a community. Um, so, you know, whereas the five point scale maybe is a little simpler, this can kind of um, gear discussion, gear discussions about possible interventions as well. Kathy, can I ask a quick question? Sure. <clears throat> is this something that you're starting to incorporate into the Medicare wellness visits or because it's not part of it? not yeah that's a great question so um i actually added it to my dot phrase <laughs> um we were thinking about studying it and um comparing it to the mod fp which is in the scenics uh and since you know it's a clinically validated indicator although maybe not necessarily in patients living with hiv the the risk of adding it was 
pretty negligible and can bring up um, discussions about interventions, as I said. So I am including it, but um, um, we have the the luxury of having a little bit more generous time for the wellness visit. So I have been including it though in the wellness visits. Just you or everyone who's doing the wellness it, It's in the dot phrase. I don't, okay. I don't force somebody to do it, but <laughs> it prompts you to collect it. Um, um, but a lot of those aspects are kind of captured in the other parts of the wellness visit as well too. So, um, but okay. And so, you know, it, you know, it, uh, it's definitely helpful from, I think, a research aspect to kind of label someone as frail, pre-frail, robust. Um, but, you know, uh, as, a as a clinician, I can understand what, you know, um, the limitations in doing this, you know, during a visit or, you know, with, this, with an individual patient. Um, you know, if there's, you know, if there's not an intervention that we can do to address it. Um, but there are, um, this is a good summary paper of the interventions that you can consider in um, patients living with HIV that are classified as frail. And you can also think of them as preventative measures too, um, even if they're not frail right now. Um, and I'll be going into more some of these in more detail, but exercise and physical activity, which I know we're all interested in living in San Diego, um, nutrition, polypharmacy, fall prevention, mood disorder treatment, cognitive impairment treatment, and addressing social determinants of health. The last of which I think is more of a uh, macro systems issue, you know, advocating for better access to care, um, you know, formations of support groups, communities. Um, so I, I won't be talking about that in great detail, but um, it's definitely important. Okay, so now to focus on exercise and physical activity, um, the DHHS and WHA uh, recommend 150 to 300 minutes of exercise per week, including balance and strength training, um, just for everybody. Uh, for all adults. And so, and the WHO specifically recommends limiting sedentary time, replacing it with at least light activity. Um, and here's uh, a randomized clinical trial assessing exercise in patients living with HIV. Um, and the treatment group got one hour supervised gym class, uh, three times weekly, plus nutrition counseling. And the control group um, got some pretty good resources too. one hour monthly workshops to discuss exercise and nutrition, which I think it would be nice to have here at Owen Clinic. Um, and, um, and there were significantly better outcomes after 24 weeks in the treatment, uh, treatment group with this, uh, specifically with quality of life, vitality, general health, mental health, fat mass, muscle mass, waist circumference, resting heart rate, and CD4 count, interestingly. And this is, you know, their exercise in patients aging with HIV actually has been, or patients living with HIV has been well studied. I'm not going to go through all these studies. This is by our own just, Dr. Jessica Montoya, but um, just to show you that it's been very well studied, that it's helpful. So, but it's not necessarily, in, you know, easy to implement. <laughs> so um, we obviously don't have a gym right in the clinic. You know, um, we do where, you know, thankful to have nutritionist services, but it's not so extensive that we can kind of implement this for everybody needing exercise and nutrition um, help. So there's some uh, ex helpful examples of exercise prescriptions, again, um, in that paper by Dr. Montoya, um, where you can talk about why, you know, it's just giving a little bit of um, information on why it's helpful to exercise, what kind of exercise you can do, and coming up with like a specific plan, like what are you gonna do? How often are you gonna do it? Um, going to start light and um, gradually move to more intense or vigorous activities and um, kind of guiding, helping guide the discussion to come up with a specific plan. And if, you know, if they count steps, including that, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's also um, a helpful uh, resource called exercisesmedicine.org. And they also have a lot of um, helpful exercise prescriptions, you know, um, uh, specifically, there's one for sit less, move more, where you can see here, you know, ideas of what to do at work, on the way to work, at home, and again, move more, and then, you know, specifically, you know, tar you know, deciding with your patient, you know, what's feasible for you to try, let's make a specific plan, and then follow up on it when I next see you. And they also have everything in Spanish, which I love. <laughs> so um, you don't have to worry about like translating it or saying, oh, you know, I hope you understand this, even though 
it's all in English. And here, and it actually has a lot of specific examples, which I, um, I wish I found I, it, this resource earlier, you know, it, there's even one for um, HIV and AIDS, there's one for osteopenia, you know, obviously, or osteoporosis. Um, obviously, it depends on, you know, your pre existing conditions, what kind of exercise you should be doing and can be doing. So it's nice to that it kind of um, starts that conversation in a helpful way. Okay, so now to move on to polypharmacy. Um, it's defined as five or more medications. Um, some, some studies kind of separate out non-HIV medications like polypharmacy of the non-ART or including ART within um, the definition of polypharmacy. Obviously, if you include ART, then you're at least two medications in just treating the HIV, which obviously is necessary to do. And so uh, <clears throat> here's a study of uh, older patients living with HIV in San Francisco, sh showing that polypharmacy um, including ART, uh, um, was extremely common. Pretty much all their patients had polypharmacy. If you included the ART, um, if you excluded the ART, even so it was over 70%, um, drug, drug interactions were very common. Um, and they identified that over 50% had potentially inappropriate medications on their list. And, um, uh, about 20% had uh, anticholinergic risk scale uh, score of over three or equal to or over three, so a high risk scale. And so, um, uh, poly the, so the interaction between polypharmacy and frailty is quite complicated and kind of additive to each other. Um, um, physical frailty um, contributes to polypharmacy, but then also, um, Polypharmacy leads to physical frailty as well. Um, and some, com you know, complications are that, you know, it's harder for providers to manage a large med list, um, you know, to notice that there's a potentially inappropriate medication on there um, or to check for interactions. Um, and it's also harder for the patient to have a high drug burden, um, you know, the logistical burden of, you know, picking up all their medications, managing all their medications, paying for all their medications. Um, accumulation of toxic effects, interaction between, you know, genetics and drugs gets more complicated, and then in interaction between drugs and substance use. Uh, and in, um, all those together lead to complications such as fall, delirium, uh, potentially pneumonia, hospitalization, and mortality. And so some uh, basic interventions. Um, I think step one is the most important intervention is really performing a good medication reconciliation with, you know, and reviewing why is this patient on the medications? Is the indication still present? Um, what are the risks? What are the interactions with other medications? And are the doses still appropriate um, based on, you know, renal function, weight, et cetera. Uh, and uh, thankfully here um, in our patients getting a Medicare annual wellness visit, um, they're all offered a visit with our retro pharmacists who, perform a very thorough medication reconciliation and um, point out any potentially inappropriate medications. Because um, I think it's easier said than done in a busy visit um, to really perform a very thorough review, um, especially someone that's complicated that you're inheriting from another provider, et cetera. Um, looking for non-pharmacologic alternatives and then reviewing VIRS criteria to identify potentially inappropriate medications for older adults. And the QR code, if you're so interested, is a helpful resource uh, called deprescribing.org. Um, it, it, it has a lot of helpful videos and algorithms to deprescribe various um, potential, you know, high risk medications um, and the beer criteria, of course. And so here's some example of non pharmacologic alternatives. Um, you know, if someone's on sleep aids, um, uh, you know, benzodiazepines, um, uh, et cetera, you know, implementing sleep hygiene, CBT, CPAP, you know, treating their sleep apnea with a CPAP rather than a sleep aid um, can all um, lead to de-escalation or de-prescription of sleep aids. Um, someone with um, metabolic diseases um, on various hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes medications, 
um, you could potentially um, de-escalate with diet and exercise, as we all know. Um, and then chronic opiate prescriptions, implementing um, interventions such as physical therapy and acupuncture, um, which uh, can be more effective and obviously less risky. Um, and uh, someone on a chronic PPI, avoidance of trigger foods and late meals, et cetera. I think we can all think of more examples, but of course it, you know, realistically it takes more time to, uh, and a lot of resources to um, do these. So I don't want to minimize that, but um, doesn't make them less important. And then now to focus on uh, fall prevention, um, there's actually a, a, a initiative by the CDC called Steady, Stopping Elderly Accidents, Deaths, and Injuries. Um, and the three steps are screening uh, to identify older adults with increased fall risk, um, assessing for modifiable risk factors, again, a, a thorough medication review, um, uh, testing their functional abilities, visual acuities, orthostatic blood pressure, um, podiatry and home hazard evaluations, um, and then intervening to re reduce fall risk um, based on evidence-based strategies, um, uh, promoting strength and balance, medication management, occupational therapy, corrective eyewear, et cetera. And so some common specific interventions are, um, you know, if strength and balance are an issue, physical therapy, and Tai Chi actually has uh, um, evidence to support it for fall prevention. Um, uh, medication, you know, you know, de-escalating or um, discontinuing medications that contribute to fall risk. Um, home hazards, asking about loose rugs, um, stair railings, uh, a grab bar in the shower. Um, and then um, there's some uh, low income resources if patients aren't able to install the, the, uh, install those the, themselves or being upon those themselves. Um, and, uh, you know, um, educating about uh, exercise and compression stockings for orthostatic hypotension and obviously um, adjusting medications, uh, you know, referring to, you know, um, ophthalmologist, optometrist, um, footwear, et cetera. Um, so there's lots of things get, that can be done. It's just knowing about the, re I think it's a lot of it's knowing about the resources and referring them and getting them, convincing the patient to actually use them. <laughs> um, so I kind of blasted through that presentation, um, but um, I, <laughs> HIV is associated with an earlier onset and higher prevalence of uh, frailty. Um, there's several screening instruments um, that have different, you know, utilities and meanings. Um, and there's but there's also several interventions that are able to uh, that can promote robustness, re resilience um, in patients aging with HIV. So let's see. Were there any questions, Jill, or just asking for slides? Oh, <laughs> lots of questions. Oh, okay, lots of <laughs> questions. Um, and and maybe people can unmute themselves once I I'm going to try to organize this by sort of maybe basic questions and then things that may <clears throat> turn into more of a dialogue. So Gabe uh, asked when we refer for hearing exams, PTOT, all of these things in the context of frailty, are these services? covered for people that only have Ryan White uh, insurance coverage? Um, so yeah, that, that gets, uh, that gets frustrating because it's, it's hard, you know, even if we see that something's associated with HIV, that doesn't necessarily mean it'll be covered by Ryan White. So um, having allies that advocate for what's covered by Ryan White, I think it's more of a macro systems issue. Um, and then, you know, I, I, it would, I would be happy if we could kind of bring some of these within our medical home of Owen Clinic to kind of um, increase access to. But again, that's more of like a macro issue. Um, but um, there, um, I think I kind of touched upon like low income resources for home safety evaluation. Chris Mueller actually sent me a, a resource that I give to patients that might benefit from it. I think it's from the Jewish Community Center or something. I, I can I can share that website. Um, but there are some resources that are available for low-income patients where um, that might be covered by like, that aren't covered by Ryan White, but they may have access to another service. Um, but yeah, that is something frustrating about, um, um, yeah, uh, trying to support pa our patients living with uh, HIV that are aging with um, Ryan White insurance. Um, 
Thanks, Kathy. Ne I think you can see Nettie's question. And Nettie, do you want <clears throat> to just unmute yourself? Because I think this comes up a lot when I mean, this is, therapy. yeah, this is it's a great talk, Kathy. I was just typing yeah. a little thing that said how relevant this is for our current HIV practice, but I'll just tell you that right out of the gate, which of course everyone knows. Um, and, but yeah, this is like the main topic we're having right now is eight people aging. Um, I had two comments. One was that um, I do think we can implement a lot of these things, even without the extra resources or without the long visit for the senior health or whatever, you know, patients can answer questionnaires in the waiting room. The patients want us to know that we're thinking about this, so they would appreciate that. And then, you know, we can do things like refer for the eye exam and, you know, do some of those fall PT interventions um, referrals right then. So I, I, I'm not going to let not having enough resources, you know, limit our progress on this. Um, I did want to talk about the medications because this is a societal problem. Like everybody wants a pill for everything. And if I say, well, actually, this is a mechanical problem. And why don't we try physical therapy and acupuncture, chiropractor, I got the long list. And I get a lot of glass eyes glassed over or there's nodding. But then there's also where's my pill today. So I think that maybe patient education, I'd be very interested in, you know, a study of sort of patient education measures and whether it's like, like with antibiotics, when you educate people about antibiotics, they don't ask for them as much. I feel like we need that for our seniors because they keep telling me, well, prescribe something for my hip pain. And it's like, I, I'm going to harm you with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the yeah, I think the deprescribing.org, which I have to, I, I, I've gone through some of it, but there's actually a lot of really helpful resources. Um, unfortunately, it's a Canadian resource, so it's like in English and French, not Spanish. But um, there's a, a lot of videos and um, posters and stuff about like why deprescribing is important. And I think you know, if you know that a non-pharmacologic intervention or, you know, maybe a safer medication is more effective, I really like to talk about that. Not everybody believes me, but I mean, I think it's always good to go from an evidence point of view too. Not only that it's safer, but it's more effective, um, um, uh, especially over the long term. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely um, easier said than done. Right. And <clears throat> Jeff makes the point, uh, who has his hand up also, I'll Jeff, I'll let you speak in one second. Just, you know, a lot of these, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of these therapies, these alternative therapies aren't covered, right? So if you tell someone, oh, well, let's refer you for acupuncture or chiropractic, it's not going to work, but we can, they can, you know, get their, um, you know, their tramadol or their gabapentin paid for. Um, I think there's yeah, a question. Oh, yeah, that I will say um, at Owen Clinic, we, I think we have acupuncture that's recently come back. So I, I don't right, think the, it, but the question is still whose insurance is covering it? What are the out-of-pocket expenses? We know that exists there and that's great, but we, you know, we don't know what the bills look like for patients who've gotten it. Um so just, yeah, 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 I, I, yeah, I think just I I oh yeah, free at Owen. Yeah, that's what I was trying to oh free. That's what I Thank didn't know. You. For, yeah. Thank <laughs> you, Laura. That's very important to yeah, you. I don't know if Nettie can answer. I know we have like the chiropractor right next to us at the Part C clinic in San Isidro. Do you, is there a pretty good yeah. guarantee that it's covered or at least there's like yeah. a scaled? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Medicare, a couple of years back, Medicare allowed FQHCs to incorporate chiropractic and acupuncture into a billable service, which was a huge benefit for Medi-Cal patients. And so it's covered under Medi-Cal at FQHCs only, at least as of when it came out a few years back. So we have integrated chiropractor and we have acupuncture. Main challenge is that patients love it so much, it's hard to get in. Um, and then it's not free for uninsured or other insurances. Um, and then we do like a package deal. It's like 10 bucks a visit or something like that. We can buy a bundle. Um, Kathy, there's, uh, and again, I'll come to Jeff after, but I think there was a couple of questions or there's question about meth and, um, <clears throat> is there any data to suggest that meth usage accelerates the onset of pre-frailty or progression of pre-frailty to frailty? And this is probably a, a really big, important topic in this area. Um, the, yeah, this is an important topic. I didn't have time to, I guess, kind of, um, thoroughly review the data on it. So I don't want to, <laughs> um, um, but I, I do imagine, I do imagine that it would be contributing. I mean, we, we know about the, you know, the cognitive and, um, um, psychiatric effects of meth. So conceptually, um, 
you you would think that it would definitely um, progress or contribute to multidimensional frailty um, as well as physical frailty, but I don't have the exact numbers. All right, Jeff, now you can definitely speak. I'm sorry. Just... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just following up on the, on the meth thing, that's the number one problem here in the desert. People come out here, there's meth everywhere. Um, they're relocated, they're socially isolated. Um, there's not a lot, a lot else to do. And, and people just get hooked and they go downhill. And it's, you know, doctors say it just kills them. And some of them don't care. They're demoralized. They have PTSD or eight survivor syndrome. And um, yeah, it's a huge problem. And then going back to the, um, you know, the alternative non-pharmacologic interventions like uh, acupuncture and so forth. So that's great. So Medi-Cal pays for it, but not Medicare. Is that correct? I'm going to uh, make a, oh, oh, sorry. Go on, Nettie. <laughs> No, if, if you know, please answer. As far as I know, it's not a covered service under Medicare, but I don't want to swear by that. Um, but I was going to say that this would be a great avenue for advocacy because the things that got added to Medi-Cal, a lot of that is advocacy, like, hey, low-income people need dental care or, you know, and if right. you guys remember, those things didn't used to be there. And so, you know, you, we can advocate for services to be included in, in these programs. Medicare is a bigger beast because of federal. So I, I don't want to comment on it, but I do want us to think about, um, you know, engaging patients and community partners in advocacy for things that we know are medically relevant and effective and more effective than the things that are being covered. So there's a great case for it. Um, and I, I know that like, some of the Obamacare plans, they, they don't have those coverage. Some of them do. So it's really kind of a hit or miss. And I think we need to, to push the issue. And if anyone yeah, knows the Medicare question, please answer it. I don't, I don't know that one. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And once upon a time, it did. I remember my doctor there, it's Keith Farrell in San Diego, had that. And he had chiropractic, oriental medicine, massage even. And he was billing Medicare. And they eventually said, uh-uh-uh, <laughs> you can't do that. But um, you know, there's a precedent for that. It makes a huge difference. And you, we don't want kind of these disparities in care. And then the other thing I wanted to ask about was exercise. Well, no, no, no the other, on the acupuncture. So you said that they subsidize it and it's like $10 a visit. Who who pays for that subsidy? How does that get covered? So we are an FQHC and I think probably Family Health Centers and Vista Community Clinic and other FQHCs probably do this also. But because we have a program for chiropractor because it's billable through Medicare, Medicaid, um, that allows us to have a program. And so then for people who don't fall under that service, you've already got the program built up. And so it's like a sliding scale kind of fee, which is true for all of our services. So okay. it's not directly funded. It's just that we're able to say, well, we have the program. Here's a sliding scale fee basically for this service if you don't have insurance, which is how all of our programs operate as the federal qualified health center. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I brought up San Isidro because I know there's like the, if you're uninsured, you have the pay scale, which I think $10 for a chiropractic visit is extremely cheap. So that that's the idea that they adjust it, the, the charge. Um, so yeah, which I think improves access, having it within the system. Uh, or I mean, you, um, sometimes you can have a little bit more, um, I think, power in uh, getting access. Um, so, and then I put in the chat, like Medicare is not like a single plan. So I guess it's a little hard to say like Medicare will definitely cover a certain thing, but you know, not other things. Um, but one, one universal coverage is the Medicare annual wellness visit. Um, and they did that because some, some plans had a high copay. So it like disincentivized patients to, um, get, you know, utilize visits, um, and get their, um, uh, preventative care. So that's why they implemented the Medicare annual wellness visit that doesn't have the visit itself doesn't have a copay so that that's not like a preventative, um, aspect for the patient to take advantage of that visit. So, yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely not a Medicare expert. I, <laughs> I I'm getting more interactions with it, but I, I mean, the one thing I do is say, call your insurance and see if you have access to it. You don't know, if, you know, that's the best way to know if you have access because, you know, just ask, oh, what acupuncturists are covered and then try calling those and seeing how much the visit would be with the coverage. I think that's the best way to do it um, because if you don't look into it, you don't know for sure. Kathy, there was a, a comment from Jules Levin earlier, I was trying to move through things, but um, 
you know, that frail people living with HIV can't do that much exercise. So, you know, how do you, or how, you know, how do you think about that when maybe the prescription is, is exercise or this is the preventative, but if you're already there, how are you going to do that? How do you, how do you address that with patients? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, so I think, you know, even if you're frail, you're doing some sort of movement, I think preserving that movement and maybe optimizing it a little bit, obviously they're not going to be like in a marathon, but <laughs> encouraging them, you know, once you lose the movement, it's really hard to get it back. So please, you know, at least preserve the movement you do have and, um, to, you know, to get out a, about and walk as much as they can. Um, so that's why it's kind of modifiable. You're not telling, you're not giving everybody the same recommendations, the same exercise plan. So I think that's the idea of an exercise prescription, encouraging them that they can exercise, but it may look different than someone else that's exercising. I think a lot of, I think pretty much most people can do Tai Chi and, you know, you know, some form of even modified Tai Chi, you know, there's, there's something they can do. And if it's very complicated, obviously visiting a physical therapist and, you know, getting ideas that way, if they have access to it. Um, oh yeah, chair yoga, I see some good, so yeah. This was great, Kathy. I, do, does anyone else have any any comments? Please feel to unmute yourself, ask questions. I was gonna encourage you to read Carla's point above about oh. Medi-Cal expansion soon. Right. Okay. Um, so Carla asked if Medi-Cal covers these types of services, and I'm sure the answer is it varies. Um, but no, Medi-Cal does. The answer is it does. Medi-Cal does. <laughs> all of these things. Medi-Cal covers. Uh, Medi-Cal covers chiropractor acupuncture at an FQHC. It's Medicare that we got all debated about. Um, but the, the second point, that, that was that whole discussion was the Medicare. Medi-Cal expanded to allow dental services, chiropractor at FQHCs, um, again, based on sort of advocacy for what's needed for low-income people. But I, I wanted to get to that second part of the point that Medi-Cal expansion in 2024 is going to include all Californians, regardless of their immigration status. And so that will be an opportunity for people who are on Ryan White, if they roll over, if they are now eligible to roll over to Medi-Cal, especially as some of our patients on Ryan White are getting older and we need stuff for them and we can't get it through the Ryan White program. So I'm looking forward to getting more people over to Medi-Cal. And one of the things that they will have if they go over to Medi-Cal is access to not just you know, hospitalization and other subspecialty services, but more services for healthy aging, such as you know, chiropractor and things like that. Yeah, I'm not really sure why anyone would stay on Ryan White if they had, if there was another option that didn't that didn't cost them anything. Some, sometimes the documentation, even though it says like, oh, everyone can register, you know, regardless of documentation status, that doesn't mean without any documentation. And so there are still people who no, no, no. I mean, it, I mean, when this yeah. happens, yeah, when, when this well, happens, I'm not sure what will. I mean, um, I I mean, right. the example I've seen is there maybe their documentation status, you know, there's an issue with that, but then they're making too much. Um, yeah. Um, why, they, why they wouldn't be able to be on Medi-Cal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Again, I'm not an insurance expert, just anecdotally. Sure. Uh, yeah. um, Leila, I see your hand up. Yeah. You also have to think about the income limit, right? The income limit <laughs> with Ryan White is a lot higher at 68,000 versus Medi-Cal is less than 24,000 a year. So right. that's also going to restrict some people to be able to qualify to Medica. Yeah, that, thank you. Okay. Good to have thank you everybody for interacting. Such, so yeah, I was going to oh. say with such great expertise on insurance, because that's, of course, where so much of this is, is problematic. Um, let's see, Larry has a question. Um, are we, it's interesting that we're always looking for evidence-based medicine. Um, are we doing the same for chiropractic acupuncture and osteopathic manipulation? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yes, there's like studies on, um, acupuncture. I, I know of acupuncture Tai Chi, um, specifically, um, but yeah, there, there are, you know, studies looking at the, how effective it is, um, 
but I probably more needed. All right, well, Kathy, we'll let you have the last word. Okay, well, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, just, uh, I'll, I'll submit my slides, so don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like there may be some people who wanna reach out to you directly for slides, and um, I think this is great. I, it was really comprehensive, Kathy, <clears throat> and I think a good resource that could be used, you know, not only locally, but um, nationally as well and beyond. So thank, thank you. you. All right, well, bye everyone. We will see you next week at maybe a new edition of High Times as suggested by my mother. Um, <clears throat> anyway, oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Anyway, have a great weekend, everyone. Stay safe out there. Exactly, Jeff. <laughs>